dozens of different permutations of what a studio business model actually is. And so we've we've been through probably all of them at this point. All your expenses are covered by this like management fee in the fund? We provide a lot more than than just running the studio. We're actually giving a lot of insights to the to the corporate around their opportunity areas. 15 to 25 or 30 companies, right? Yeah. We charged a $250,000 fee per year per venture, and we took a 5 to 10% warrant position. We would essentially value the company at a million dollar valuation. We look for kind of the big, boring vertical industries. And you are not risking actually, <laughs> like taking this 20, 25, 30%. And we decided we, we did not want to go be in the game of raising LP money forever. I'm inviting you to join the Venture Studio family community where Venture Studio founders and managers meet regularly to discuss and to learn and share best practices on operating a studio. You are considering either joining this community and yeah, there can be your potential competitors also looking for founders to partner with and to launch successful companies or you can consider not joining a studio but missing the valuable information and knowledge sharing in the group you might fear the competition between your studio and other studios in the community at the same time it's much more advantageous and beneficial to be inside because you can grow faster with the studios inside the community than being an independent outsider studio uh, and doing your own mistakes and learning on your own mistakes so check the description below in the comments venture studio family and join the community happy to talk to you zach can you please uh, tell a short story of coplex like yeah. how we transitioned from in, an innovation agency to, mm -hmm. to the studio yeah, yeah. So the company started back in 2000. Uh, my business partner, Ilya Posen, um, started the company, ran it for about 16 years as a kind of traditional innovation agency studio studio model. I actually took over uh, took over as CEO in 2012. I uh, ran the company for about four years as a as a traditional agency. The uh, kind of infamous white paper of venture studios dropped around that time. It was 2015, 2016. I'm one of the first kind of groups to put together any formal research on on this concept. We read the white paper and it talked about how the future innovation agency business model um, is a venture studio. And we got really, really excited about this. I think we were a few years into um, sort of the, the the grind of the agency business of, of trading dollars for hours and not really having any upside or exposure in the, the good work that we do. And the paper was timely and um, inspired us to just revisit our own business model um, at the at the studio. So we, uh, 2016, um, I actually sort of combined the effort of the business model redesign with a management buyout and a fundraise. So we went out and used the kind of the uh, the repositioning as an opportunity to raise some capital into the business and. Uh, Brought on a few investors in, in 2016 and went all in on the studio model. And yeah, I mean, since then, uh, as, as you know, Max, there's, you know, dozens of different permutations of what a studio business model actually is. Um, so we've, we've been through probably all of them at this point. <laughs> How many companies have been created in mm. Complex? We've, prior to the studio model, we had worked with about 250 startup companies um, and kind of corporate spin outs. Um, since we made the transformation to the venture studio model, we've probably worked with about 150, of which we've launched and, and kind of still maintain an active portfolio of about 65. And are there like 75 or 85 were external startups and you help them? Or so like 65? <clears throat> created from scratch together with entrepreneurs, right? Or with companies? Yeah, that's right. So our model, that has been one constant in our model since we we went, uh, we flipped to the Venture Studio model in 2016. 
we've always worked with external entrepreneurs and external ideas. So we, we identify ideas from the outside. Sometimes the entrepreneur and the idea come from the same place. More often, they, they don't. So we've been, been through a few different permutations of the model, but generally our concepts today, our ideas come from our corporate partners. And then we run a search to find CEOs to run the businesses after we bring them through some validation exercises. What is usually equity split? Do you invest money? Uh, or you just help with your team? And what is actually equity split between a uh, corporate partner, you and uh, entrepreneur? It depends. We have kind of a, a, a full range uh, for our corporate partners on they can work with us to design the studio and we advise all the way up to we fully um, kind of fully manage the, the venture studio for them and then just report back on a quarterly basis. And they play more of a governance role or an LP role in the studio. But I would say our general structure would be um, launch a studio fund. We, we would co-invest in the fund with our corporate partner. We would end up taking what looks like a you know 20 to 30 percent carried interest in the fund and then we we take a management fee uh, from our from the corporate partner where they usually pay us directly to run the studio uh, the management fee it's not a traditional kind of you know two percent management fee it's an annual fee to the corporate to run the studio that allows mm -hmm. us to cover all of our overhead in the studio so we basically break even on the management fee we charge to our corporate partners um, and then we make our upside on the carried interest in the portfolios and and Obviously, if we co-invest alongside the corporate partners in the in the GPLP fund structure, we we can participate um, in the upsides as an LP as well. How many such uh, venture funds uh, have you created with uh, corporates? Three that are active right now. We've probably done okay. seven or eight at this point in total. This means that. Uh, fund gets preferred shares in startups while investing in the startups during probably pre-seed and seed round. Right? Yes, it's a little different. We um, so the we put the fund together. The fund essentially makes uh, you think of it as a typically it's a half a million dollar investment into the into a new co. Um, we actually mm -hmm. get we get founder stock or common, um, not taking a, a preferred. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't issue mm -hmm. preferred stock for these at the formative stages. So um, we invest a little bit of money. Um, we get some common, we carve off, I mean, the typical cap table of the, the, the startup, you've got a 15 to 20% equity incentive plan for employees. We're trying to get our, our CEOs that we place somewhere around 25 to 30% these days, uh, fully diluted on a four-year vesting schedule. Typically, our part between us and our corporate partners, we're about half of, of the remaining pool. And then obviously, we, you know, um, as the companies go on and graduate the studio, they're typically going to go raise this an outside seed round. And at that point, we we have a pro rata right um, that sometimes we exercise, sometimes we don't, just given the, the sizable positions we have in the companies at that stage. All your expenses are covered by this like management fee in the fund and you are getting <laughs> equity in a company plus carry 20 to 30 percent from from this fund when it invests right yeah I think of it as um, kind of a zero percent management fee 20 percent carry fund sometimes we'll invest and be an LP in and then the management fee is um, uh, so I'll give you a more, a more concrete example right so we we run the venture studio for for Phoenix Children's Hospital here in Arizona um, and each year we we basically um, we send them a we send them a bill to, to run the studio. So we don't actually use, mm -hmm. uh, we're not actually using the cash in the fund mm -hmm. to cover the management fee. It's kind of a, a totally separate invoice that we send out. And that includes a lot. Uh, it includes, you know, running the studio, uh, the quarterly reporting. We do kind of quarterly insights and analytics and reports on what we found when we've evaluated, you know, all the different concepts we've evaluated, how they've scored against our rubrics. We, we provide a lot more than than just running the studio. We're actually giving a lot of insights to the to the corporate around their kind of opportunity areas, and and we're able to to get paid with get paid for that work, and and that covers the cost of the the internal complex team. Can you also explain what is your value for startups in terms of like, do you have some team which actually builds and, and is doing marketing for these startups to develop them? Or you help corporates <laughs> to launch their venture studios and you gather team inside, inside uh, 
their their company or you I don't know teach or prepare them for for launching startups with founders. Yeah, it's it's all outside of the corporate. Um, so anytime we run a, a studio with our, with our corporate partners, even on the the ones that we we help design and advise, we're 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 essentially getting them out of the corporate as fast as you can. Um, we we find it pretty difficult to to use internal corporate staff to run a studio. Um, so we we like to get them get them outside of the studio. We, we, we launched a venture studio with one of the Blue Cross Blue Shield chapters. And for them, we actually help them design the studio. We help them spin it off of the corporate parent. Uh, and it runs as an independent studio now. It just so happened that uh, there were maybe six or seven people that were inside of an innova- innovation group at this Blue um, that that spun out and, and, and took full-time. They quit their job, their day job, and took a full-time job at this studio that's kind of sponsored by by blue. Um, so we try to keep them, keep them very separated, but, but yeah, it just depends. Some of our studios will, will build, um, an internal team entirely. We'll help them hire the right people to run the studio with different capability sets. Um, and then others, we actually bring all the capabilities ourselves and manage it entirely with our, with our staff. So it just depends on, the on the studio. Uh, what is the size of your team, uh, core team of Coplex? We're eight full time right now. We were, um, prior to COVID, we were about 35 full-time uh, and we've moved, we've, we've just, we've kind of shifted our own business model a bit where um, we no longer staff product design, product development and uh, yeah, product design, product development resources. That was the bulk of our team prior to COVID. So we had, you know, mm-hmm. 18 engineers, you know, we had seven on the product team, including UX, like UX designers and things like that. Um, so we moved away from staffing all those in-house we've we've kind of partnered with vendors and freelancers now um that we just bring into the companies directly rather than keeping them on our payroll so that's why we're a little smaller now you launched within this funds about 65 companies and uh if you had uh, like six uh funds 10 companies per fund 5 million fund these are the figures um, a little different is that we've been through is that we've been through quite a few different models. From 2016 to 2019, our business model was we charged a $250,000 fee per year per venture, and we took a five uh, five to ten percent warrant position in, in every company that we started. And then it was really in 2019 and 2020 we moved to more of a GPLP mm-hmm. structure with our partners. Um, so it, it varies a little bit. So the 65 companies that we have in the, in the portfolio, um, I would say probably 40 of them are, um, are warrants. And then there's probably 20, 25 now that we have, we have interest through, um, these vehicles, either these joint ventures or these funds with our partners. Warrants. Maybe I don't know this word. Can you explain? So similar to a, 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 um, a call option, um, it's, so basically, we come into a company when we we started up. This was kind of our model from 2016 to 2019. But we come into a company, um, we'd have an entrepreneur and an idea. We'd have a little bit of funding to to get it kind of pre seed funded. We would essentially value the company at a million dollar uh, at a million dollar valuation, and we would take a five percent warrant um, as part of our support we provide to the company. So it's part of the compensation that we receive. We get a warrant. Um, the way, way it's structured is 5% warrant at a million dollar valuation equivalent. So we put a $50,000 exercise price in the warrant. And then essentially we, we get, you know, a piece of all the upside action. Assuming we, we exercise the warrant, we pay $50,000. We end up with a 5% fully diluted position in the business. How usually do you launch funds with corporates so they just uh, invest in this fund or you attract also external limited partners one we're launching right now with a a mid-market defense contractor that one we will bring in a few externals Um, but i'd say all of them to date are either single lp um, with the corporate as the lp or single lp plus our Mm -hmm. investment so we we keep the uh, the limited partner base pretty small in the in the funds generally Can you share your learnings of using different structures for these deals? Like why you moved to this GPLP structure? What was the difference with the earlier approach? Yeah, I mean, the, this is the, 
the ultimate challenge of, of the venture studio business model, right? Um, we're talking about building venture scale businesses that probably have a 10 year average path to liquidity. Because if you look at, you know, it's, it's typically some of the recent data, we're looking at like 7.4 years from first outside capital to an exit on average. We're coming, studios kind of by, you know, by nature are coming in a year or two prior to first outside capital. So if you, if you look at this, we're, it's, it's a nine to 10 year path to liquidity. The challenge with any studio is you have to come, like the more effort you put in to help build these companies, there's a cost associated with that, right? You know, the more support you provide, the, the bigger that cost gets. And you have to compound that over, you know, 10 years before you get money back mm-hmm. from the investments that you make and the hard work that you do. So you essentially have to fund the business for 10 years before you start seeing a return. So there's kind of a, a really interesting kind of cash flow game in, in studio business models. So you have to fund the overhead. And it's really, it's really difficult to get good people that are willing to roll up their sleeves and do actual work uh, for just equity. Um, the ones that you want actually doing the work, they, they, they probably don't appreciate equity <laughs> Um, all, all that much, right? So a, a piece of the upside, yes, but you gotta, you got to get these. If you want studio staff, you have to put them on payroll. In our original business model, we, we charged the entrepreneurs themselves the $250,000 fee, and we took a 5% warrant and tried to run as close to break even as we could. We had a couple of years where we, we dipped below and actually had to, to raise capital to keep the studio operating. Um, then we moved to kind of this kind of corporate sponsor type model where we'd find an entrepreneur and an idea and we get a corporation to sponsor them through our program for equity. So now we had the, the 250K fee was paid by a corporate sponsor. And then the entrepreneur would get a little bit of working capital from, from that same that same sponsor to build the business for a year. And we took a warrant. And then in you know, 2019, 2020, what we realized is we, we kind of had it, it, we we hit a bit of a plateau. It's really hard to find to, to, to do all this matchmaking work, idea by idea, with an entrepreneur, a corporate sponsor. It's really really hard to scale. So we we stumbled into the corporate, the larger corporate space where there was a real need to solve this problem. Like corporations cannot build startups internally. Uh, it's it's damn near impossible, and all of them have desires to to do that, right? Um, and, and a lot of reasons why they should do it. They've got lots of unfair advantages um, that, that could be really helpful for a startup. So we saw a need in the market where the large corporates were willing to, to, to fund them to do multiple year, per year. And, and they, they were willing because it was solving a, a, a deep enough pain for them that they're actually willing to pay a, you know, a, a decent management fee to build and run these programs. Um, kind of above and beyond the, the the investment in the company. So the reason we ended up in this space, to be completely frank, is because we didn't want to be in the game of having to go build a huge sales team to find these entrepreneurs and sponsors. And we also didn't want to be in the game of perpetually raising funds. Um, we because it was one of the things we said from really the start with Coplex. We had a, we had our, our own fund in 2016 for a little bit and decided that that would be the end the end of it. Um, mm-hmm. And we decided we we did not want to go be in the game of of, of raising LP money um, forever. So this was kind of a way to solve all of that, right? We we got the corporates to the corporates come in, they cover all of our overhead to run the studio, allow a little room for some profit um, on good years. They provide the the capital needed to build the companies, and we can still get a, a piece of the upside and kind of opportunistically invest. What is the size uh, the size of the fund usually? Um, twenty. 20 to 40 million typically every fund is for 40 plus companies 40 to 80 right no so typically it's um you know anywhere from five to ten ventures a year for a three to four year kind of deployment uh-huh. process and then we uh-huh. hold back a chunk of the fund for per pro rata mm-hmm. follow-on investment 15 to 25 or 30 companies right yeah i mean each each studio is a little unique, but yeah, and it also depends too. Um, and sorry, this is the 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 answer. It's um, they're they're all a little bit bespoke, right? So with Phoenix Children's Hospital, we actually do take the management fee out of the fund. In others, we don't. So in the ones that we don't take the management fee out of the fund, they're they can be a little on the the lower end of that spectrum. And then we 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 cut our we we get our management fees outside. So it just depends on the the structure mm-hmm. of the of the deal. Mm-hmm. This partners, corporate partners, uh, which you have, what is the source 
uh, for them like do you have some outreach process mm-hmm. or they they all go to you because know that you built venture studios for corporations uh yeah lots of, lots of outreach so we have um uh, we have a, a full-time business development uh, guy michael on our team he's he's the one kind of doing all the outreach the corporate partners you know th- there's a lot of interest in this in this category just corporate venturing corporate innovation corporate venture studios you know there, there's a lot of interest in this space and I think the challenge is they, you know, they're, they're typically two to three year sell cycles, right? So um, mm-hmm. a lot of the the studios that we run and the studios that we're, we're actively designing today, they're deals that we've been sort of nurturing for, you know, two, three, four, five years. So it takes a while to close these deals, but once you do, they can, they can be really good partners. What are the main challenges when you partner with corporates? And what are the main challenges to convince them or persuade that it's a great deal to partner with you and you you know how to do studios better than anyone else or yeah. other than they? <clears throat> there's not a lot of players in the corporate venture studio space. Um, there's a couple that, that you know that we, we run into every now and then, but not very often. Usually what we're competing against is is almost like an internal function. Um, there's a lot of corporates. It's definitely an education process to get them convinced that this needs to be built outside of the of the organization. That's always the, I, I think, the big struggle. It's, it's a very complex, especially when you're working with finance companies, insurance companies, healthcare companies, mutual companies, and some, we work with one that's a 501c3, they're a nonprofit. Yeah, there's kind of some weird kind of legal tax structural implications that we had to be really careful with. So it's it a lot of the time with the corporates is kind of convincing their boards to take the risk to build this externally and, and have kind of a separate team and get it outside of the general corporate governance. Maybe you have some uh, insights about what is often organization seems to be potential partner for you yeah like what what do they have to have inside that you understand that oh, this is our potential partner a lot of the prospecting we do we're looking for we're looking for billion plus dollar revenue organizations that have some sort of a lot of a lot of times we watch to see who launches corporate venture funds it's a really good indicator for us that there might be they're, they're thinking about this stuff so if they launch a fund launch a new fund hire someone to to run uh, hire someone new to run a corporate venture function we're kind of keeping an eye for those types of, of signals but our focus we, we tend to find large boring vertical businesses um, so we're not you know, we're talking to one of the largest automotive freight companies in the world. We're talking with large payers, um, malpractice insurance carriers. We're talking with auto insurance carriers. We're talking with, yeah, companies in the defense industry um, that are like defense contractors, right? We look for kind of the big, boring vertical industries that don't have a lot of kind of tech capabilities and know-how internally. Those tend to be a better fit for uh, for what we do, because that's part of what we solve for. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you do this uh, only in the US or are you also looking for international? We've yet to actually run a studio outside of the US, but we've uh, we've got a lot of prospects now. It seems like there's a lot of interest right now in, in kind of the GCC, MENA region, Middle East, and um, we're seeing a little bit more in Europe now. So yeah, we're prospecting some opportunities there. Can you describe what is your process of uh, partnering with entrepreneurs? What is your profile? How do you work and how do you attract them? Maybe what are you looking for in these entrepreneurs you join, which you attract to, to your startups? Yeah, and my my favorite answer of the day, it depends, right? So just to give you an idea, when we work with a corporate, <clears throat> the first thing that we do is we spend, we spend three to four months with the corporate to design the studio. Um, and this produces a 120 page document essentially where we look at every single element of the studio. Uh, one of the sections is is CEO profile. And so we actually build based on the particular needs and, and, and goals of that unique studio, we decide what the evaluation rubric is for entrepreneurs as well as for the ideas. but we'll, we'll kind of build that rubric uh, and then we you know 
we'll we'll help run the process of or we'll write the JD, we'll post it, we use our own networks to post the JDs, and then we'll typically, if it's a vertical specific business, we'll go and kind of talk to some of our VC private equity friends in that vertical, other entrepreneurs in that vertical. So we'll we'll actively support in the recruiting process to find top of funnel candidates. And then we usually run our own version of a top grading hiring process with these with these CEOs. But yeah, each each is a little a little unique. We've always tilted in the direction of non-technical CEOs. So we prefer more revenue focused um, mm-hmm. and like uh, kind of yeah, like revenue focused CEOs versus like engineering focused CEOs. Um, that's just kind of built, been a, a tilt for us since we started. I think a lot of that is because we were solving for a lot of the tech. We were solving for a lot of the products and we feel very comfortable in those, in those worlds. So to complement that, we, we, we kind of orient more towards the, the industry expert revenue focused entrepreneur. And um, that's just a general tilt for us. You attract entrepreneurs with idea or MVP or maybe first revenue and you help them to, to develop. Or you also attract entrepreneurs without any ideas? Yeah, typically we work with the corporates. We work, a lot of them have like an idea management system or they're, they're tracking a bunch of internal startup ideas already. So as part of the studio design process, we'll build a rubric for evaluating the, inter- the actual ideas themselves to see which are a fit for the kind of the, the general studio structure. Evaluate all of their ideas. We might bring some of our own ideas to throw into the mix, but generally the ideas come from the corporate. And then we score them against the rubric that we, we co-develop. And then once we have an idea that's worth experimenting with, we'll go do a kind of a customer validation, customer development phase on that. Well, do some business model design, make sure the business model makes sense. Then if that checks out, we'll go do some customer discovery, customer development. We'll run that process for 60, 90 days. And then if, if we get the results we're looking for out of that experiment, then we'll, we'll actually write a job description for a CEO, go source them again, you know, evaluate them against the rubric, score, um, score them, pick our top few, run them through a top grading interviewing process. Um, and then we'll, we'll make an offer, um, a cash, cash and equity offer to the CEO we place. If an entrepreneur comes to us and they already have an idea or they've already built something or they've already got a company or they've already raised a little bit of money, they're generally not a good fit for us unless they're in one of the verticals that we, we run a studio, right? So if you've got something in you know, space technology, um, if you've got something in auto insurance, medical malpractice insurance, in the payer health insurance space, um, and pediatric care technology, like if they fit one of the verticals for studios that we, we run, um, we'll just refer them to the studio. We'll, we'll consider them, but, but it's pretty unusual that we're taking outside ideas. Usually we're taking ideas from the corporate and, and starting them from scratch. So how many startups do you launch every year? I just want to understand probably the team. You have not a big team to support many startups. I just want to understand like what is your input in the startups in, in terms of your team? Yeah, we used to do our, our top year was in 2018. We launched 20, I think 27 companies. We do a lot less now. We're, we're kind of, yeah, it's been a little, a little bit more pointed. We've got 2024, we'll probably do 12 to 15 companies that we'll launch. I mean, we'll evaluate probably 50 um, and, and kind of work through some validation customer development, but we'll, we'll launch probably, yeah, 12 to 15, I would say next year. What is the support of those startups and how you can spread your team between those 12 to 15 startups? It, it depends. That's part of the, the studio design process for us, right? We, we, um, so one of the sections in the studio workbook, and I'm happy I can share some of these artifacts with you too, if, um, yeah, if it would be helpful, but um, one of the sections is CEO evaluation. One of the sections is um, idea scoring and evaluation. One of the sessions is our modules. So how do we phase out the program? And then under each module, there's capabilities. So what work is done with the entrepreneur in each module and basically what services are provided by the studio, what services are provided by like outside vendor networks. 
So for each studio, it's a little unique. You know, we used to do engineering, product design, product development, back office, governance, legal, accounting, finance, recruiting. We used to do it like all. And that's when we had a team of you know, 30, 35 people full time. We've since pulled back the the generally when we run studios, we encourage our partners not to build product organizations inside of the studios, but rather to work with you know, trusted vendor networks and guide the process. Some of the things that are kind of standards in our studio, we like to have, we, we definitely like to support with kind of finance, back office, governance. We have kind of our trusted legal partners that we typically work with. Um, we, we like to roll up our sleeves and get involved in kind of the uh, kind of the facilitation of the lean startup process that's run during the 12 months um, of our studio engagements. We, we get involved in strategy, financial modeling, FP&A. We, we get involved in uh, obviously any kind of fundraising efforts. We get involved with like a fractional CTO type of an involvement where we're kind of reviewing you know, overall architecture. We do play a pretty heavy role on kind of the product management side. Um, so if they do work with one of our vendors, we play a role in helping kind of define product roadmap and again, kind of facilitating that lean startup process um, as it relates to product development. Yeah. So th- those are probably the big, the big areas, kind of back office, uh, fundraising, finance, FP&A, governance, fractional tech, and, and, and sort of product management. Those are probably the big ones. What you mentioned, like six to seven people inside, was it about a team of corporation in their venture studio. So can we say that like you have your, let's say, venture builder or venture studio, you help companies, uh, corporations to launch their venture studios fund. Plus they have also a small team of six to seven people helping those startups, right? Yep. Yep. The the larger studios will have an in-house team and then we we play a supporting role. Uh, like our my staff plays a supporting role in those studios. Mm-hmm. What roles do they play inside of corporation venture studio inside the corporation? Like what they what they do for their startups? We don't fully manage where we're designing, supporting, advising. We usually help hire a CEO to run the studio. Mm-hmm. So we build the studio outside of the corporate parent, uh, find a CEO to run the studio itself. And then based on the capabilities that the studio provides to the ventures during the program, we'll help them build a team um, inside of the studio. Yeah, it's a, it's a similar you know, a similar makeup to our own studio uh, or kind of our own staff. We're, we're trying to get those same kind of categories of, of support. And some of our studios, we have a, like one of the studios we help design in, in New Mexico. Um, it's a very IP heavy um, like IP and commercialization heavy deep tech studio, right? So that's going to have a very different staffing requirement, a medical malpractice insurance carrier that's looking to build insure tech companies, right? So it's just a, a bit of a different staffing makeup for the studios, depending upon what types of companies they're trying to build. So usually marketing is on the CEO part and the team of the startup marketing and development, right? Yeah, to Typically, and we've got some vendors, kind of key vendors we work with on the marketing side of the house. And we, we do like to play a heavy role in you know, running the process around marketing. Again, it's kind of back to the lean startup approach, right? We, we like to make sure that the we're designing, we, we use a lot of the Alexander Osterwalder frameworks. We do you know experiments and test cards and learning cards. And the test cards kind of define what marketing needs to be done. And then we use that to kind of gate the, the the marketing efforts to make sure we're not going in and just burning a bunch of cash on marketing a business that doesn't that hasn't been validated right so we control a lot of the marketing process but we be, we bring vendors in to actually do kind of marketing campaigns and things like that typically the startups will pay for those vendors directly What is the most difficult in managing complex uh, or building venture studios or startups? Like what is the most difficult part? You know, it's, in our model in particular, it's, you know, waiting out very long, slow processes to get these studios designed and funded and spun out of the, the corporate parent. It's just a very long, boring sometimes process. Um, that's probably the, the big one. I, I just think, and I love the work that we do. I love working with with entrepreneurs and building businesses, but it, it is a, it is a hard thing to scale. Um, we've, we've always had the approach, you know, we, we've never wanted to, to just go build two, three, five, six a year and leave it at that. Like our, our ambitions have always been, how do we build 
kind of the playbook, the process, the structure, the templates, um, the vendor networks, uh, and the capabilities that would allow us to go build 50 or 100 a year. And that's still that's still our ambition um, is, to, is to get to that. So hard to scale, but but that's uh, that's what makes it interesting. Two questions or ideas, like the limitations of this are first difficult to scale. What if I don't know hire several business development managers who will outreach many companies around the world? Like, will it help or not? And the second, like, what might be the ways to shrink this time frame of decision of a corporation? Like, can they agree not in two years, but like in a half year, uh, what must be done? Do you have some ideas? I think the, the difficult to scale part is probably less about the business development and sales function. It's probably more about having the right expertise on the team to support a larger you know, a larger cohort of companies per year, right? So if we're building a, a dozen companies a year, um, we can talk to, like, I, I can personally spend time with all 12 companies on a at least a monthly basis if I need to. When you start getting into 30 or 50, it's really hard to do that. I guess it, it's harder to, to be hands-on and support kind of the operations of these companies when you get bigger and bigger portfolios. Perhaps with with the right team, it could it could be done, yeah. The second uh, question about like what might happen in the process of partnering with organizations that they will be ready to launch it faster, to decide faster. I am open to any ideas that you have <laughs> on that, Max. It's uh, corporates. Uh, corporates move pretty slow. We've uh, the the things that we've experimented with. Uh, again, I talked about like the signal of launching a corporate venture group, or like the signal of a new leader coming into a corporate venture function. There's like signals that we've identified that that tend to correlate with like shorter time horizon to buy. Mm -hmm. Um, But beyond that, uh, we were, you know, we haven't found a way to to really short circuit that process, unfortunately. (laughs) Who's usually responsible for for such decisions in in corporations? Did you have some cases when you contact owners of of the companies? Or it's always some top management role? Yeah, it's it's usually in kind of mid-market companies, it's always the owner. The CEO and owner, founder, bigger companies, it's it's the C-suite and the board. Um, it's usually the CEO and the board. One that we're working with right now, it was kind of through the COO to the board. One was from the CIO, chief innovation officer, to the CEO. Um, but those are tricky. Like honestly, a, a learn some learnings that we've had in the last year or two. For these to really work, you, you have to be like our point of contact almost needs to be the CEO. Even even of the the biggest companies that we're working with, we work through conduits like you know like a chief innovation officer. We tend to run into a lot of a lot of challenges. So, and yeah, the board the boards are heavily involved in in these types of decisions because it involves spinning out a new company. It involves you know capital budgeting, long time horizons that are typically beyond the scope of what you know, any you know, middle management or upper management would be involved with. Um, so this is, yeah, it's typically the boards are very involved. Like almost all these were in order to get, once we design the studios, a big, one of our key deliverables is it all, almost always a board deck. So a bunch of slides for our internal C-suite to go take to the board to convince them to do the studio. That's almost always one of the artifacts that we produce. Can you tell a bit about the portfolio? So like from 2016, you started to get equity in startups. How the portfolio is going? What are the most successful startups? Looking at my my list right now. Um, some of the ones we're really excited about right now, um, there's a company here in Phoenix called Quick, Q-W-I-C-K. Um, they're an on-demand labor marketplace for hospitality. So hiring caterers, dishwashers, servers, um, that sort of thing. Um, they they just uh, just raised their Series B. They're they're sitting at around a two hundred million dollar valuation right now. That's been that's been one of our high flyers of late. Um, we also got one also coincident kind of coincidentally in the labor staffing world as well. It's called Nursio. It's a two sided labor you know labor marketplace to to place nurses and kind of non acute medical practices. And they're actually growing like crazy in the last few years. Um, they've actually bootstrapped. They haven't raised a dime of outside capital. Actually, at a, at a pretty similar GMV to what Quick is, um, without a penny of outside capital. So 
We're excited about that one. We've got um, a company called Notaru that does mobile notary services. Um, we've got a company called Steady Install that does furniture. Um, uh, again, another labor staffing marketplace for furniture installation and, and, fur- and moving around furniture for commercial use cases. So office building furniture. Uh, we've got a company called Yellowbird that places environmental health and safety workers and in, in gigs. MedPlace that helps um, insurance carriers and, and lawyers find experts to do case reviews. So if you've got a complex medical malpractice claim that involves some, you know, weird surgical procedure, this platform can be used to go find an expert that, that deeply understands that particular surgical ex- or proce- procedure and they can uh, do a thorough case review and give an expert opinion. Yeah, we've got a company called Heads Up Health that does kind of biohacking health analytics. Uh, they actually just raised around about two weeks ago. So yeah, th- those are some that... Mm-hmm. That they come to mind. So, out of this uh, sixty-five companies, how many are alive? All of the sixty-five are are alive. I excluded the ones that are uh, business from that that count. So, but plenty of those as well beyond the sixty-five. Earlier, you took five percent. Now you are taking like twenty or twenty-five. If, if I'm right yeah, right. yeah, we went from five as a warrant to ten as a warrant to now. If you kind of like look through the kind of the fund structure to figure out our fully diluted ownership percentage. We we typically start out at 20 to 30% ownership in, in mm-hmm. each company. And you are not risking actually <laughs> like taking this 20, 20, 25, 30%. So because like your expenses are covered by this payment from the company and also like you get this equity plus you get carry from investments. No lose game or how, how to call it, I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, occasionally we'll put some some capital to work as, a, as an LP in the funds that we helped start. But beyond that, that's why we've landed at the business model we have. It, it, essentially, we cover our cost, we get upside on every deal we build, and then we get an opportunity to invest if we want to. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a good place to be. It's just, uh, like I said, if, you, if you're patient enough mm-hmm. to wait out a two, three, four year process to mm-hmm. sell partner, mm-hmm. um, I, you know, there's, mm-hmm. there's plenty of this work to go around for other studios. What is your pitch to companies? Like, why do they need to create their venture studio? Yeah, I mean, its tagline for corporates is innovate faster. The venture studio model, it unlocks speed for these corporates. These corporates have idea management systems with hundreds of ideas sometimes in them. And they see a huge value in building these companies or building these capabilities, but they don't have any internal capacity to do it. And even if they did have the capacity, they don't have the compensation structures. They don't have the governance. They don't have... You know, things would have to run through their chief security officer for approval. You know, we, working with companies, like I've seen companies take a year to stand up a merchant account to process payments for like a SaaS solution they try to build internally. Um, it's they, they move too slow. They can't build these things and they can't build these things internally. They can't do it themselves. They really have a need to to have these businesses and products get built and exist, right? So we give them a platform to take these, you know, the best ideas that they have and actually turn them into businesses that they can use. They can, you know, they can use themselves or or not. So yeah, that's that's kind of our our big pitch to the corporates is innovate faster. And by the way, you can make a decent, if you do it right, you can also either clear your hurdle or or get a decent IRR um, from, from these investments, so. I asked you about, I don't know, 15 or 20 questions, but maybe I didn't ask something which might be very interesting to many venture studios and which you have experience in. Maybe you can share something more. The thing that uh, we hit on a little bit earlier, but you know, being in the venture studio game since 2016, I, the, the biggest takeaway, and I, I don't know if I even would have started one in 2016 if I would have known this, right? Um, mm-hmm. The yeah. path to liquidity. It seems so obvious. Um, like if you go talk to anyone in venture about this model, they'll they'll know they'll they'll understand this point right away. But a lot of studio venture studio builders, owners, entrepreneurs that I know out there that are playing in this game, they're not really honestly hardly thinking about the time to liquidity, and it, it is key. So, like 
all of us in venture studio land are, are experts at business model design. Like that is why we do what we do. But I, I think we, we also have to understand our own business models. And, and the difficult part about the venture studio business model is you've got to wait 10 years to get paid if you do really good work. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I challenge entrepreneurs running venture studios to really get creative about how they solve that. So there's options to get, you know, there's sponsorship models, there's getting the entrepreneurs themselves to pay, there's getting corporates to pay. There's... How is it possible, like getting entrepreneurs paying you 250K? Yeah, we for the program. We did that for uh, three years before we moved to the sponsor model. So we we found we found segments of entrepreneurs that had industry expertise, capital, and an idea. Um, hard to find, but some of them became some of our most successful companies. Uh, like that, some of them that I just rattled off actually came from that model. Quick and Yellowbird and Nursio all came from that model. And those are three of our most successful companies. So hard to scale, but you only need to find a couple to really drive the returns. And you don't have to worry about perpetually fundraising, right? Mm-hmm. So the fund can be a great structure, but it's very hard. It's extremely hard to find LPs that are interested in the venture studio model for, you know, a, a, a thousand different good reasons. So yeah, even there's a couple of people that are starting fund of funds specifically for venture studio funds. That that's an interesting concept, right? They could almost make an asset class out of this. So there's just, I, I, I challenge studio owners to get really creative about their, how they're going to fund all of their shenanigans for 10 years while they wait for that first mm-hmm that first distribution to come back. Super, Zach. Thank you very much for, yeah. for your insights. It, yeah, thanks really, for having me. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. Great. Good luck with the event.